I am Abhiman from the Next Web, and I want to talk to you about uh, the High Connect Network. Yes. And so basically, you know, I come from India, where I think it would be really difficult to do a social network for like a billion plus people. So I just want to understand. Will it be? I think so. <laughs> Trust me, I'm on WhatsApp groups for my apartment building, and that's. Yeah. <laughs> so what I want to ask you is like. Um, you know, what, uh, how does uh, you know how do Armenians think about uh, being connected to each other? You, you know, across the diaspora of ten million people, and how do you think that uh, with social network you can have really uh, meaningful conversations on there, as opposed to just being you know, full of people saying, "Hey, I, I have this need," and you know, and not really having true connections, especially across borders. Um, one of the realities of the Armenian uh, existence is the diaspora in existence, as you said, and. Because of that, the idea of having some type of digital platform connecting all Armenians came to us, you know, number number of years ago. And at the time, with the previous regime, when we were thinking about such a thing, it was a way of mm, connecting the diaspora to each other so that it can better uh, deal with the current Armenian reality in terms of Armenia. But after the revolution, the concept uh, evolved into a more kind of you know, uh, everyone who, who's Armenian or who's interested in Armenian things can basically set up their profile and join. It didn't become a diasporan kind of connection thing. It became a pan-Armenian connection thing, which I think is more integrative, uh, inclusive, and more powerful. Um, you know, the, the, this is something that I th we've all agreed as Armenians uh, that we desperately need because we've got such diverse Armenian communities around the world doing some amazing things. but. For example, I, and I'm pretty dialed into the Armenian reality of the diaspora, I have no idea what's going on in Marseille with Armenians in Marseille, what they're doing. I know of one director there, maybe a couple of friends, but that's all I know. Now, maybe I'm developing a tech platform, maybe I'm developing a music project or whatever, and maybe I need a French Armenian rapper, you know? Like, there's no way I can find that guy on Facebook because there's just, I mean, you, you need to hire a team to just go through stuff on that channel to be able to whittle down any you know concept, uh, any any uh, particular target like that. So I think that's that's what I'm talking. That's what we're talking about here in High Connect is to basically be the Armenian Nation Online, connect everyone um, using their interests uh, to form uh, integrative platforms and uh, uh, focus groups, symposiums, and I think it'll be very helpful to Armenia. One of the things we lack politically is proper diaspora and Armenian political think tanks, for example, that I always thought we need to counter some of the, um, you know, other think tanks that are working against uh, Armenian interests around the world, for example, you know, but, but also to help Armenia and the Armenian nation. And so this could be a nice platform if anyone's interested in a think tank, hit me up, you know, in our, on Armenian topics and develop one through that. There's the amount of things that can happen that, the, you know, that are positive with, with such a platform, I think, will be amazing. I've got to go to other questions. Sorry. I, I travel a lot in, in Armenia, and I meet and interview politicians, everything. But I noticed that the vast majority in Armenia they physically live in 21st century, but mindset, they're still in 18th century almost. Pashinyan did the political revolution. Who do you think will do the social and mindset revolution? I think, look, Armenia is an old nation and we have a lot of customs and, and rituals and there's, you know, your reference point is likely a US or Western reference because I know where you live, um, you know, and so, we have to take things as they are uh, in, in any country that we're dealing with. Um, and I think in Armenia, obviously, the revolution did, did an amazing, it's a gift to not just Armenia, but to progressive democracy around the world that will be replicated in the near future elsewhere. I know it. Um, but yes, there are some issues. You know, there's, there's elements of a conservative society here that may not appeal to your Western senses. Um, However, I think that's also being worked on, from what I can see, um, from a number of nonprofits doing amazing work within the country to, you know, the government itself is, is opening up some amazing avenues of uh, representation, of justice, dealing with issues of women's rights, human rights, etc. So I think that 
work is being done simultaneously. I don't think it's a separate uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, it's not a separate uh, person or, or entity that's going to be able to do that. Another, any other questions? Thank you. Hey, Mikhail, uh, Money Crashers. I was just wondering, out of all the formats you've used for activism, um, music, artwork, the High Connect project, which one's been the most successful in you know, raising money? Um, which one's reached out to the most people you feel like? And which one has, have you just enjoyed the most? Wow, those are a lot of questions in one question. Uh, <laughs> um, well, High Connect is, is a new project, so we, we you know, it, and it's a foundational project, so it's a nonprofit project. And so there's no money making there for anyone. There's no control there for anyone. We're a founding board, and we wanted to do that to put Armenians in touch with each other. Uh, that much about that. A lot of our, my other musical pursuits are my own musical pursuits. I use pretty much every social network that's there to engage with the audience that I have. And, uh, you know, whether I like how that platform's being used by others or not is irrelevant in that sense because I use it as, as a, you know, form of direct contact uh, with you know, followers, um, but I, you know, but most of my concepts and thoughts regarding activism, you know, although I spread it, at, uh, spread it to social media, uh, is, is actually based on research that I do, not just online, but w with talking to people um, and feeling out what things are, where, where things are going, uh, what they're feeling. I think that's a big thing. I think you can't just rely on uh, social media. In terms of political, for example, across my social networks, I use Facebook both for, you know, releasing information about things that I'm doing, whether it's records or coffee or whatever, but also a lot of political stuff because you could put a link. Instagram, for example, you can't really put a link. So I don't do as much there for that. And I do other things, more uh, creative stuff, art stuff, picture stuff. Uh, Twitter, I can use like, you know, Facebook and whatnot. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but that was, that's what it was. <laughs> Next question, yes. Hi, Matthew Caver from the YouTube channel Vsauce2. Uh, as, we, uh, as we met Armenian creators in the YouTube community, uh, we realized that there is no localization for Armenia. There's no YouTube.ai. Right. There are for 102 other locales in the world, Interesting. but not here. Uh, in the Bruce Sanofsky documentary, you spoke about uh, the cultural elements in the diaspora. You did with uh, talking about High Connect as well, how important it is to have a hub there. What do you think is stopping Google and YouTube from flipping the switch on that localization that would benefit the creatives in the Armenian? I'm not sure you'd have to ask them. I have no idea. Um, you know, it is a small market, um, so maybe they haven't gotten their advertising um, gurus in place to be able to utilize it, or I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. I have no idea. You should ask them. Do you think that's an important hub, though, for uh, the Armenian community, both within the borders here and worldwide? Uh, I think it's definitely an important hub, as we see from this conference, a huge tech conference taking place here, the um, revolution itself and the things that we have to learn from it in terms of decentralized civil disobedience and peaceful resistance. Armenia's got a lot to teach in, in the 21st century, um, and uh, so it is very important to pay attention in terms of the tech world here, for sure. And they should open, they, sh they should do that, for sure. Uh, maybe one of, again, I'm... I'm it's a hypothesis, but I'm thinking maybe that Armenia is such a small country that artists here, for example, that make a music video, they really want to get on, get it on to others, not just Armenia, obviously around the world, uh, the diasporan community, as well as, you know, the, the general uh, public. So maybe that's what it is. But again, I don't know enough about the dot .am dot .country idea of how it's set up for I either tech firm to be able to answer it properly. Next question. Okay. Uh, no, 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 Factor TV. Uh, so we all know how passionate you are about the revolution, and we know how you did everything during that. And a year and a half almost has passed uh, after the revolution. What changes have you noticed, both positive and negative, after the revolution? And how do you think post-revolutionary Armenia is doing? Uh, let me start by saying, uh, from from I I follow Armenian news daily from the US uh, or wherever I am uh, so that I can keep up with what's going on here because it's very important to me. Um, and I am not just excited about what happened a year ago, but I'm excited about what's happening right now because I think what's going on here is uh, miraculous. I think, you know, in one year we've seen incredible numbers of growth from the economy to tourism to pay, 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 payback of international loans to growth in the job industry. Um, 
I mean, it's, it's, it's like all the numbers are up, and I'm, I'm looking at it going, wow, this, this hasn't happened in Armenia in a long time, maybe never. And this doesn't happen to any nation overnight either. You know, it, it took a special, you guys actually, <laughs> it took you guys actually doing something about your future and realizing the potency of your vision and the ability to take over that, you know, created this situation. I'm extremely positive about what's going on, but it's not just me. Like when the revolution first happened, I went back to L.A. to my diaspora and Armenian friends at parties or whatever. They would come ask, they'd be like, you were there, tell us, tell us what's going on. And people were trying to process the information, understand it better, asking questions, etc. A year later now, they're, they're the ones jumping on planes coming back. You know, I don't have to be inspired and tell them, hey, the revol you know, this amazing thing's happening. They already know, because a lot of them have come back already, which explains the rise in tourism. And they're all excited. They're coming to me and saying, oh, I'm doing this in Armenia, I'm doing that in Armenia. So all of this is happening now at the same time. So I'm extremely hopeful for the future. Uh, yes. This is Philip Nagels for Develt in Germany. Um, my question what was the What was the news outlet? I developed the German oh, okay. daily newspaper. Cool. Uh, my question is not directly tech related, but it is about connecting people. Um, you were featured in an episode of Parts Unknown with the late Anthony Bourdain. Uh, could you talk a little bit about how food helps to shape identity across borders, but also to bring together different cultures? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I was here in 2017, October, to film CNN's Parts Unknown with Anthony Bourdain. I had invited him to Armenia. Um, a friend of mine had, had nicely gotten his email for me, and I had invited him just cold call, basically. And I couldn't believe how fast he reacted. In 10 minutes, he had written back and said, you're on. And I'm like, this must be a joke, right? And then his producers called over that summer, and we organized the whole trip and everything like that. And I was so happy. It's one of the best times I've had in Armenia, just coming and going and basically eating with him and laughing with him and drinking amazing Armenian vodka with him. So it was a great time. I have incredible memories. I was very sad, obviously, needless to say, about his passing and, and the way in, in which it happened. Um, I think f food is a great identifier of cultural color. Um, you know, one of the reasons I'm doing coffee, I've got a coffee brand called Kava Coffee, which we just launched yesterday in Armenia. Uh, it's, it's a traditional Armenian coffee. Well, it's modern Armenian coffee, but based on traditional values, kind of like remembering how my grandmother and mom, you know, made coffee in the house, the way it would smell, and the types of conversations that would occur. And my goal for make, I mean, my reason for doing that, that line is basically to export Armenian culture via a food item, you know, and, and, and Armenian coffee. So there's people in the U.S. now because uh, we launched online in the U.S., buying Armenian coffee that have never tasted Armenian coffee now. So it's a huge factor. I believe in it, obviously, because I'm doing it myself. And I think it's very, you know, one of, to me, the most beautiful thing about nations isn't their borders, isn't their flags, isn't their military might, nor their economic prowess. It's their colors. It's their food. It's their culture. It's their music. It's their art. It's their tradition. And food is a huge part of that, obviously. Yeah. Question? Well, I say I was just wanting to ask about the cover coffee because yeah, I think doesn't it make it for you yeah, a little bit uncomfortable because Armenia wasn't like pretty famous before, like, for coffee before, you know, like it was famous for wine, it was famous for brandy, but never for uh, coffee. So, isn't it hard to you to represent the Armenian coffee for the world? For the world? No. <laughs> no, I mean it's actually good that it. If you're saying Armenia wasn't famous for coffee, then I'm glad I'm doing it. It's even more of a reason to do it. Questions? Hi. Hi, thanks. Uh, this is Manet from Tech and coming to this conference. Uh, I love tech it. stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, are you interested in this tech stuff going on in Armenia? And uh, do you see any other perspective, like people change their perspective about Armenia from this tech uh, perspective? Like, do you see any? Uh, and uh, like besides revolution, uh, do you see any perspective from this pack? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everyone that I've spoken to who has come to Armenia, who's non-Armenian, has been really enjoying the conference. Has been enjoying uh, being acquainted with uh, with Armenia. A lot of people for the first time, and I think I think that's where it, that's what's important that to get people to come here, uh, meet our beautiful people, and see what we're doing. Not just in other industries, but in the tech industry. And I think Armenia, because of its uh, 
you know, uh, level of education, because of TUMO, I want to say, because of different uh, initiatives to really push the kind of modern technology platform as a nation. And in a way, we don't really have, you know, we don't have uh, ports, we don't have water. We, you know, we, we're a tech nation, we're designers. When Anthony Bourdain did CNN uh, uh, Parts Unknown, he said that. He, he said Armenia is the brains of this part of the world. That's those, that's, those are his words. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's what it's talking about. And I think people are being really impressed by what we have to offer here. Hi, I'm Setar Balian from Ramgabar Mamun. My question is also not related to IT, it's about, as you know, Western Armenian is listed as a definitely endangered language in UNESCO. Uh, what do you think the government of Armenia should be doing to preserve this language and the diaspora in general as well? That's a very interesting question, actually. Thanks for asking. Um, I know that uh, a friend of mine, Vaya Berberian, uh, a year ago, I want to say, went uh, at, to the Gulbengian Foundation Center in Portugal. They're doing some amazing work in trying to preserve Western Armenian, um, uh, you know, as a language. Uh, and, and there's a number of nonprofits doing that work. I'm not sure what the government is doing regarding that. I think um, so, it's, but, it's, but it's interesting to look into it. Um, I think there's definitely uh, work to be done there. Yeah. yeah. There is also, I think, a lack of uh, entertainment in Western Armenia, like TV shows, well, political part, shows, yeah. and all of that. Yeah. Do you think that would help, like, or is it sure. a too limited audience? I think we should have a gangster movie made about Burchamud in Lebanon, in Western Armenian ghetto dialect, and that'll make that'll make it interesting. For example, <laughs> but but yeah, I think it's it could be effective to answer your question properly. Yes. I hope, but it's sure I got to. Okay, yeah. Call Dari, call Dari, system of a down of Galis and Kerevan. Hunisin, call Dari. Yeah. Ash Hadum and Kuran, Yevrobagan Turin Kanum, Kaldari, Maisin Hunisin, Yevat Yevrobagan Turin, Iprev Ban Masnagit, Yerevan Abel Srazen, Portsum and Gash Hadel, or may I love Nergatsuman? Nerotu Tervestachem Garo Asel Vorde, Nayum and Kedahozum, Laman Bolor variant Nera. Ayo. Uh, no, there isn't. Uh, you know, the, 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 the news story stays the same in that regard. <laughs> we haven't been able to see eye to eye in a way of going forward with creating new music together, but we're all brothers. We're, uh, we respect and love each other, and we tour together, as, as I just mentioned. And so, and, you know, and that's okay, you know. But if we do, that would be great, you know. Next question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, should I answer in English that everyone gets? No? Yeah. Uh, I, I hope that um, Armenia is able to capitalize upon the legacy of what's happening now with WCIT and the, the, the conference and the, you know, the different people meeting each other and different tech solutions being offered. And, you know, in, in a lot of these business type of environments, it's really about putting people in the same room together and seeing what there is out there and who's working on what. And I'm sure a number of Armenian firms will, um, I know a lot of Armenian firms are benefiting from this, uh, tech firms, as well as other international firms working in, in association with Armenia. Next question. I'll ask you somebody. I'll throw you some political question. Of course you will. Of course you will. I know you have years. Um, Washington keep mixing economy with socialism, uh, nationalism. 
he keeps saying, come, come to Armenia, buy an apartment. Do he realize he's going to inflate the prices of apartments and the poor Pakistani will not be able to either rent or have it because there is this practice happening in other countries. For example, Vancouver, Canada. The Canadian told Chinese, come, come, invest $250, 50000 we'll give you passport and $100,000 apartment become $1.2 million. And now people, the, the government is struggling, trying to do something that people cannot rent or buy. So is Pashinyan aware of that? that he keeps saying people, hey, come buy. I, can, I cannot speak for the prime minister nor any government official, obviously. I have no idea. But what I can say is that I wouldn't relate what's happening in Vancouver nor New Zealand with Chinese investment. New Zealand just, I lived there part of the year. And New Zealand basically, uh, because of the amount of investment, uh, their real estate prices were bubbling up so much that they had to contain it and they made it illegal for foreigners to purchase property. The problem that we're dealing with now is not, I don't want to say problem, but the, I think the intention from what I'm seeing is to <clears throat> gather Armenians back to their homeland. <clears throat> and that's what it comes down to. At the same time, creating economic stimuli within the country. Now, whether that's opening a business or buying a home, which I'm interested in doing in Armenia, for example, um, I think all of that is great. And it's, the country is not at a point of the amount of uh, real estate prices going up, nor, uh, nor at a point where there's sufficient investment in real estate to even worry about that problem. Maybe one day when we're at that problem, if we're lucky enough to get to that problem, a decision can be made accordingly. Okay, before you buy a apartment, can you let Is me this know a question? Where you <laughs> I'm not going to tell you where I live. Are you crazy? You're a journalist. <laughs> Next question. So I should buy an apartment before the price goes up. Good one. Next question. Uh, Hi. Uh, Good morning. Uh, Armenia is not yet in an apartment. I didn't say I was buying an apartment. I said a house, but it could be an apartment. Um, I like specific specifications. Um, uh, we, we looked last time I was here with my wife last year in July. We were looking. Uh, and we couldn't find a place. I'm going to actually go look at a few places before I leave. But it's not very easy to find a place, you know, uh, that you want to live, that you want to have your family in. And so it was, it, the, the search goes on, but I'm sure we're going to find one soon, hopefully. One more question, please. Yes. Uh, Armenian government still claims there are no reasons to stop the Amosar mine. Okay. And are you still keeping your position on it? Am I still what? Are you still keeping the same position you mentioned before on Amusar? Um, yes. I mean, look, I am. I've been involved with. Uh, I've been involved with the Armenian ecological. Uh, uh, well, how do I want to say this? Those that are struggling to keep Armenia ecologically clean for many years, from Tevut days before the Tevut mine started to Amusar, I've supported them. I've worked with them. And the problem with what's going on in Amosar in this country is the fact that it's being politicized. That's the problem. Uh, we not only have an ecological possible disaster, but we also have a litigation possible disaster. And we also have people that are counter-revolutionary or those that want to abuse the situation politically that are using the issue against the government. So that seems to be a problem. Um, as someone who's worked in ecological matters throughout the world before and has supported Armenian environmentalists, I don't like it when people politicize the issue. For example, people that have never been interested in the ecology of Armenia and our business people are now saying the mine shouldn't open. That, that pisses me off because they never gave a shit. Why do they care now? So that's a big problem for me. Um, I don't believe that mines are good. Any type of mines are not good for the ecology of any nation. Um, What's, what's going on right now in Armenia, as you know better than I do, is that they are looking at every possible factor from environmental damage pro, uh, prospects to also legal prospects because of the liability of business arbitration, etc. I think they are doing more research in this issue for the last year than I've seen any government do in the world for any issue, any mining issue, including the United States. So I give, I give respect for that and I hope the right solution can be made and, and that's all I have to say about that. Next question. Are you the only one with a question? <laughs> but in case force is used against those uh, people living in the I, I can't hear you. In case force is used against those people living in the villages around the mine. Why would force be used? I'm sorry, I, I don't understand the question. Are you ready to stand behind those people who are right now closing the way to mine? And in case 
force is used against them. In case it rains today, are you ready with an umbrella? I don't know. I mean, there's no such thing as in case. Um, I think that people have to really understand what's going on. Uh, I, think, I think it's great that the Armenian environmental movement has taken a front seat in, 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 in the Armenian world. In fact, for years I've been encouraging the Armenian environmentalists to start a Green Party of their own in Armenia. I think that would be amazing. I've even hooked them up with the Green Party of New Zealand, for example. Um, I think they should be in the forefront for politics, but not in, a, not in an abusive manner for the nation. I'll leave it at that. I've answered your question. <laughs> Next question. Any, any other questions? Otherwise, I'm off. Uh, can, you sing something? can I sing something? No, not right now. <laughs> oh, just a few minutes ago, you mentioned that maybe you, you are going to open a business or something. Can you give us a I didn't, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm having a hard time hearing you. You just mentioned that maybe you will open a business in Armenia. I just heard it. Can you give us some sneak peek? Or I didn't say that, actually. But what I did, what we did yesterday is some uh, friends wanted to start Kabat Coffee Armenia uh, so the, as licensees for our uh, coffee brand in Armenia. So we did the launch for that here. Yeah. If there are no other questions, I'm taking off. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.